Scarta. For those of you who may not know me, I'm the senior pastor here, and we are honored by your presence. I want to encourage you in these moments as we prepare to uh, fill out the uh, registration form. We call it a connect card. It's a perforated tear-off. If you would take a moment and fill this out, put your name and address, indicate whether you're a member or a guest, we would love to have that information. Later on, when the service is over and you exit the sanctuary, there are brass offering plates at the doors. If you would just fold this over and place it in there, we would receive it. And for those of you who are members of this particular congregation, and this is a Friday night worshiping congregation with your offerings, you may also leave those as you exit this evening. Uh, following the service tonight, there will be a reception and book signing with Dr. Willeman in the gathering hall right through these doors in the adjacent area. Also, Holy Communion will be celebrated in Shamblin Chapel for those who would like to receive it immediately following the service tonight as well. A reminder that tomorrow at noon, uh, Dr. Willeman will be speaking in, in the Great Hall uh, just downstairs. You're invited to attend. There are some more plates available. Uh, you may want to simply come and listen and not eat, but you're invited to come and join us tomorrow at noon in the Great Hall. Uh, once again, welcome to all of you, and let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship.
Christ did not come into the world to serve, be served, but to serve. He is in our midst today as one who serves. We celebrate our servant Lord by worshiping God. Let us sing and pray until we too have become servants. Children of God, let us share Christ's love and peace. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, during these last faithful days as we prepare to enter Jerusalem with Jesus, we have so many mixed feelings inside of us. We remember your son's triumphant entry into the city with shouts and praises, even as we prepare to join them with our own praises. And yet we remember too that this happy parade becomes another kind of parade that leads to shouts of crucify him. And our hearts are broken by those very shouts and the pain and the suffering he bore that day. And yet we know that it is because of his choosing to enter Jerusalem and taking the path he knew he was taking, there's hope, grace, and salvation for all. And there are still many in need of hope in our world. And there are still many in need of your grace in our world. And there are still many in need of salvation in our world. Lord, into our lives, our churches, our cities, our nation, once again today, heal us, Lord. Transform us. Renew us. Draw us closer to you in this journey of Holy Week that lies ahead. Empower us with strength and courage and with the assurance that you are with us, world without end, even as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Lashina. Since 1951, the TJ and Inez Rainey Lecture Series, endowed by the Alton Rainey family and significantly enlarged in 1957 with gifts from the Dallas P., Robert W., and Tom Rainey families, has brought the finest preaching to Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church, to the city of Little Rock, and indeed to the state of Arkansas for the purpose of inspiring and challenging God's people. Over the years, this series has welcomed outstanding theologians and preachers like Ralph Sockman, Elton Trueblood, Carlisle Marnie, Fred Craddock, John Killinger, Brian McLaren, and most recently, Bishop Vashti McKenzie. The uh, Rainey family is still a part of this church today, and we are blessed to have them tonight. If you would just raise your hand, or let, let's give them a word of thanks for a round of applause for them. Thank you so much for this great tradition that continues even now. We continue this great tradition this weekend with Bishop William H. Williman, one of America's most influential preachers, theologians and authors. I confess I'm biased about Will since he was my homiletics, that's a fancy word for preaching professor at Duke Divinity School in the mid 1980s. His ministry has made a tremendous impact on both my theology and my preaching these past 30 plus years. So if you have an issue with me, I suggest you take it up with Will <laughs> at the right. end of the service. Seriously, as professor of Christian ministry at Duke Divinity School today, bishop of the North Alabama Conference for eight years prior to his retirement, and dean of Duke Chapel, Duke University, for 20 years prior to that, Dr. Williman has been on the cutting edge of what is happening in the church today. He is one of America's most prolific Christian authors with more than 60 books under his belt and recent works like Fear of Other and Who Lynched Willie Earl are bestsellers. In 1992, Bishop Williman was named by Baylor University as one of the 12 most effective preachers in the English-speaking world, and he still is today. One of Will's traits that I've always admired and tried to emulate in my own ministry is his honesty and his integrity. Will is a prophetic voice that the church and our nation and the world desperately need to hear today. Following the scripture reading, we will be blessed to hear Bishop William H. Willman. You are invited to stand for the reading of the scripture, which is Philippians 2, 4 through 11 in the New Testament. <clears throat> Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. It's wonderful to be here as, as a rainy lecturer in this great train of visiting preachers, and great to see my student, Britt, leading in such a great way. This is such a vibrant congregation, and many of us look to you for your leadership, and we thank you. Now, it might be possible that what a TV preacher from Houston who preaches to more people than I've ever preached to on Sunday mornings, but I'm too charitable to mention his name, it might be possible that what he says about us is true. Namely, that we are good people, we are making progress, we want to do well, we want to unleash our human potential for good. That could be possible. It might be possible that what nine out of ten Americans think about God, namely that God is up there, out there, powerful, omnipotent, unlimited like we are. God can do anything God wants to do. It might be possible that that were true. Except for what happens next Friday. This dark Friday that we call good. For on that day we, we saw who we are. Uh, we are those people that just honoring scripture, we got organized, going to make uh, Judea safe for God, and we, we all got together and we marched up a hill outside the holy city and we just happened to torture the Son of God to death. Uh, and there we saw who God is. God is not the one who stands different, distant from us. God is the one who is described in the letter to the Philippians, the one who became obedient, servant, even unto death, this one whom we nailed to the cross. And even as he was dying, he looked down upon his crucifiers and said, Father, forgive. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, he looked down from the cross and said, Brothers and sisters, I love you still. We believe that Good Friday is therefore the truth about us and the truth about God. Why should people love the church? asked the poet T.S. Eliot. He says, Because only the church tells us of sin and death and other unpleasant facts of life we would rather avoid. Uh, I'm really impressed that this many of you had the courage to come out and stare at truth like this. This isn't happening all over town. Uh, here is the truth about ourselves that we have been avoiding and the truth about God that we find difficult always to take. The distinguished preacher Barbara Brown Taylor, I remember was in a campus discussion at Duke and it was during Lent and someone asked her about how can I really understand the, uh, the why why did the nice person like Jesus Christ end up on a cross? And Barbara Brown Taylor said, Well, have you ever had someone tell you the truth that was so true and so painful you wanted to murder that person for telling it? You haven't? Well, then the cross is probably going to be a reach for you. That's sort of what happened. Uh, I, here is truth 
Here is truth that doesn't come naturally. It is truth so painful the church sets aside 40 days to make us stare it, stare at it in the face. Uh, and we in the church, let's be honest, we're always in the mood to avoid such truth, to somehow uh, look at something other than the cross. I, when I went into ministry in the early 70s and went from seminary back to South Carolina in the early 70s, I, I kind of thought I was entering the front lines of a war. The civil rights movement was in gear. The Vietnam War was winding down. And uh, all of my youthful mentors were people that had gotten into some trouble with, with preaching the truth. And, uh, but about 40 years later, when I became a bishop, and I went back into the, the trenches with the church, it seemed to me that a lot of us, a lot of us pastors, we, we had basically let pastoral care giving uh, trump, unfortunate word, but trump uh, every other aspect of ministry. At, that, that somehow the acts of hand holding and ambulance chasing and looking after the aches and pains of, of older adults and health deterioration, that that had become the main acts of ministry. And truth-telling had taken a back seat to that. I complained about that. And one of my district superintendents says, Bishop, don't you think among us preachers there's always that hope that we can work with Jesus Christ and not get hurt for doing it? Don't you find that to be true? Well, the cross says that this is not optional. This is just the cross is what the world did to Jesus Christ. And as Jesus was up front on a number of occasions, the cross is what people do who try to follow Jesus Christ. That's just the way it works. Back when I was a campus minister at Duke, I took a student to lunch. And... Uh, he, uh, and I asked the student, I said, well, what do you think about Duke Chapel? I like to ask students that, you know, when you come, what's your impression of what we do at Duke Chapel on Sunday morning? And he said, well, I, I never think about it. In fact, I've never even been in Duke Chapel. I said, you mean you've been a student at this university for two years? You've never even walked into the biggest building on campus, the symbol of the university, Duke Chapel? You haven't even been in there? And he said, no. And I said, well, you know, you're a, it, it's Lent when we talk about the cross and failure and pain. And you're a Duke football player. I, I would think there would be a connection there for you. And um, he said, no, I just, uh, and I said, well, do you think you might ever like come in the chapel before you graduate, might come to worship? He said, I might, but, uh, you know, um, I, I think, uh, you know, from what I remember uh, about Jesus growing up and the church and all, uh, you, uh, I, think, I think, you know, I'm smart enough to kind of figure it out that maybe if I did come to church, and if Jesus did get involved with my life, uh, my life would only become more unmanageable. And I got enough problems as it is without having to take on Jesus Christ, okay? And I said, wow, that, that is a surprisingly intelligent comment. Uh, that is the best reason I've ever heard for not coming to church. I, that is so good. I'm going to do that in needlepoint and frame it and put it on the front door and say, don't come in here if you're basically happy with your life as it is. 
if you don't want to be put into risky, threatening situations, if, if your aches and pains are all aches and pains you can handle, don't come in here. Because Jesus Christ does that. He, he, the Son of God, the best person who's ever lived, was nailed to the cross. That's bad enough. But then you think about those moments along the way where he turned and said, oh, by the way, there's a cross that fits you too. And you cannot follow me if you don't take up that cross daily and follow me. In other words, Jesus Christ makes the crucifiers the crucifers, the cross bearers. Every Sunday morning here, you, you come in here behind the cross. And take that as an image of that's, that's kind of the Christian life. Who's a Christian? Christian is not necessarily somebody's straight on all of Scripture and got the beliefs down, nailed down. A Christian is somebody walking behind the cross of Jesus. A, a Christian is somebody obedient to Jesus who takes up a cross and walks with it. When I was a young pastor, I was in a church in South Carolina, and uh, we were having some trouble. There was conflict in the congregation. Uh, people uh, were not happy about some things that they were hearing and things going on. It was difficult, and, and I tried this, and that didn't work, and I tried that, and they didn't like that either. And so I was just pouring out my heart to a senior, an older pastor uh, that I had known and, and say, you know, can you give me some ideas to help me to kind of do bit to fix this and, and to solve this problem. And uh, he made a few suggestions, but he said, you know, I have a good chance none of that's going to work, uh, but uh, you can try it. And uh, So I, I said, oh, well, I, I just, I can't continue. Something's got to happen. I've got to find a way to do. And he, took, he said, son, let me reassure you that Jesus that God uh, is never going to let anything worse happen to you than God let happen His own Son. Feel better? <laughs> Listen to a lot of my sermons. And, and I imply that, that, that's, that God is not who Philippians says God is. God is not who is portrayed in the Gospels and enacted during Holy Week. No, listen, and I'll say, uh, are, are you depressed? Uh, and you say, well, yeah, I, I watch the evening news. Yeah. Uh, or uh, are, do you, are you feeling anxious? Well, come, come, come to church. Come to Jesus. He'll fix that. Having difficulty in your marriage. Having trouble with your teenagers. Come on in here. Jesus can set all that right. Uh, that, that's, a, that's good news we wish were true. The cross says, here's the good news. The very God that you tried to shut up, the very God that you, in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, drove out of the world on a cross, this God, from the cross, looked at you and said, brothers and sisters, I love you still. Now to you take up my cross. This is the way to life. A Christian is, by the work of Jesus, a crucifer. And the church has no reason to claim this will make your life easier or nicer or you get what it, it just claims this is true. This is the truth about who God actually is. And maybe even more glorious, it's the truth about who we are meant to be. I preached one Sunday on forgiveness. And it was there, that text about forgiving, uh, 
How often should I forgive? How about seven times? How you like that number? Uh, Jesus said, no, no, 70 times seven. Forgive, just limitless. Forgive, forgive, forgive. And uh, so at the end of the sermon, I'm shaking hands with people at the door, and uh, this woman comes up to me and she said, do you mean to tell me that my abusive husband, who made my life hell for a decade, till I finally had the guts to walk out on him, do you mean to tell me that Jesus Christ expects me to forgive him? And I move into that posture preachers have. I said, hey, uh, you know, we only have 20 minutes for these sermons. I, I can't <laughs> properly qualify every statement. Uh, 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 spouse abuse is a horrible evil. It's a terrible thing. And, 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 uh, 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 you, 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 and, and uh, but, but you, he, he did say, forgive your enemies. And I can't think of a bigger enemy than your ex-husband. And, uh, 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 and I, I, I do think that maybe he did say that. And she raised herself up and she said, thank you, just checking, and walked out. And I tell you, it was like the heavens opened. And it was like a voice from heaven said to me, Hey, now who told you that you were supposed to protect her from me? When you look at her, all you see is just another victim. That's all you see. Just, hey, you're a victim. Keep your head down now. Contort your voice into a whine. And all moral responsibility is all. You're a victim. When I look at her, the voice said, I see a crucifer. Amen.
Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not so much about fun as it is about faithfulness. And Dr. Willimon has reminded us of this tonight as we stand at the uh, edge, the beginning of Holy Week. I want to invite you to be seated for a moment. Uh, we have an opportunity right now to uh, perhaps uh, pose some questions of uh, Dr. Willimon. Uh, I have a microphone. If you would like to ask questions, I will come out among you and allow you to do that. You have the bishop in house, and so it's your opportunity to ask him about anything. Well, almost anything. As Brent is uh, walking down there, that last hymn, who selected the last hymn? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's done by a Methodist preacher in England, Fred Pratt Green, who wrote his first hymn when he was 60. And anyway, I, I love that hymn. And I love the fact that he didn't get started until he was 60. So, uh. Questions? Come on. From a rainy family member. Greatest concern for the Methodist Church at this time, please. The greatest concern for the Methodist Church at this time. Uh, you know, I, I this isn't being uh, disingenuous, but I, I hope that I hope that the greatest my greatest concern is it will be faithful to this peculiar gospel that this and the Wesleyan vision of salvation for all uh, out of that gospel and that we will uh, get in gear with that. And uh, I think it's sad that we're expending so much time talking about organization and uh, structure and that kind of thing when I think our time would be better spent doing like what you did tonight, open up the scriptures, listen, try to align ourselves with the scriptures. So I think of that. Uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I just think Jesus Christ is determined to have the whole world. And Methodism is an instrument in his attempt to move out on the whole world. When we turn in on ourselves and we worry about these things, uh, I, I mean, here's a church that's lost two and a half million members beginning the night that I was ordained. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. And uh, so we're debating about who you can keep out and who you should have in, and uh, anyway, so, I don't get it. Others? You go. Where did I go to seminary and where did I serve? I went to Yale Divinity School and thought I would leave South Carolina for good. In New Haven, Connecticut, I found out sin was not limited to South Carolina. Uh, and, and uh, so where did I serve? I served the little town of Clinton, South Carolina. And then I served the town of North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where I was Vanna White's pastor. <laughs> my, my, ministry, my ministry peaked too soon. Uh, she was in my class, my annual class on sex, dating, and marriage from a Christian perspective. Uh, then I went to Duke, and then I left Duke and uh, went back to Greenville, South Carolina, which is my hometown, served the church, not my home church. Uh, just a footnote to that, uh, Bishop Willman preached the commencement address uh, in 1987 when I graduated from Duke University along with Melinda Gates, and his sermon title was The Vanitizing of America. Uh, the Wait, that was, that was, uh, that was Ted Koppel. That was, a, that was his address. Oh, yeah. was that Ted Koppel? That Coppel? was Ted Koppel's address. Well, you look so much alike. But they actually said that, and I took it as a great compliment. Uh, 
But yeah, Ted uh, kind of maligned my old parishioner, Vanna. But, but anyway, the vanitizing of America. Yeah. I have one serious question. You have spent much of your uh, ministry in an academic setting, but you've also been a bishop uh, in the United Methodist Church. Is there a, a disconnect between our, our seminaries and the university and the church itself? Do you see problems? Do you see uh, needs, things that need to happen or change in that regard? You know, there are disconnects. Uh, some of the disconnect, I think, is good and important. Uh, that is to get people away who feel called to ministry and have them intensely prepare for that kind of outside the church for three years. Uh, I think the work is peculiarly demanding and we, they need to be away and think. One of the crises in our church right now is I think we've got to do some thinking our way out of this uh, malaise that we're in. Uh, some of the disconnect is, though, uh, unfortunate where we have people come out of seminary and feel that I got a bunch of good ideas, but I don't know how to do anything. I don't know how to lead anything. Uh, and I really am glad that a lot of conferences are stepping up, working on that, and people are. When I was in Alabama, people would sometimes say, now what do you miss most about your life in academia as opposed to your life now as a church bureaucrat here in Alabama? And I thought about that, and I said, Eventually, I answered, uh, the, the thing I miss most is the Duke Undergraduate Office of Admissions, who, through their vetting and their application process, ensured that I could spend every day with people who thought just like I did. Uh, they had different races, and we came from different backgrounds, but all of us had been equally successful at manipulating the American educational system to our personal advancement. That's why we were at Duke. And, uh, and it was just wonderful. We had some of the best conversation. Well, here in Alabama, in the church, we're forced to work with anybody Jesus Christ drags in the door. And uh, he will not let us have an admissions committee. I, I wanted that, but uh, and that means we have some really deep disagreements, and you hear some stuff said that shouldn't be said, and it's and you have to argue, and you have to pray, and you uh, and you have to be church with people that you would not have chosen to be church with if, had you gotten to do the choosing. So uh, I think of that. else besides Brett and Wesley had the most influence on your ministry? Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Scarda. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, since I'm here at Pulaski Heights, uh, I was speaking on the church and race Sunday in a Methodist church in Durham. A woman came up to me afterwards and said, I served under uh, Carlisle Marnie, and he was a great Baptist prophet in the Carolinas and all over the Southeast. And uh, uh, Carlisle Marnie, uh, and, and she said, the last time I heard him was at Pulaski Heights, United Methodist Church in Little Rock, uh, and he died six weeks afterwards. And I said, would you believe I am going next weekend <laughs> to Pulaski Heights? And she said, well, yeah, be sure you have a will. Uh, I said, I don't, I, I'm not saying there's a connection. It's just, uh, but he was uh, the rainy lecturer. Uh, but I, uh, I ran into Marnie when I was a college sophomore. He'd come to my college, Walford College, which is a, kind of a mirror image of Hendrix. Uh, he, he came to Walford College my sophomore year, Religious Emphasis Week, and I just never heard preaching like this. 
uh, much of it incomprehensible to me as a sophomore. Anyway, I was in Amsterdam running around Europe, and uh, I saw this older man down there, and I walked down there, and I said, uh, aren't you Dr. Marnie? And he said, yeah, who are you? And I said, well, I'm just a college student, and I heard you when you came to my college. And uh, uh, I said, well, what are you doing around Europe? And he said, I'm recovering the Jew. I've been to 19 synagogues in two weeks. He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, just trying to uh, chasing after girls and trying to have a good time. And Marnie lunged at me and he said, boy, you take me for some kind of fool. Uh, are you going to lie about what you're doing here? Or are you going to tell me what you're doing here? Or do you not know what you're doing here? And I said, uh, uh, I, I guess I don't know why I'm here. And he said, all right, all right, that's a start, that's a start. Anyway, we walked out, had a conversation together, and uh, that was the beginning of my call into the ministry. And uh, I told Marnie uh, uh, during that discussion, I said, I'm, I'm not thinking about being a pastor, I don't think, and I'm not thinking about Jesus. And Marnie said, son, I've been working with Jesus a lot longer than you have. I know more about him than you do. This has got Jesus' fingerprints all over it, let me tell you. <laughs> so that, that was, anyway, I mentioned that since he was preceded me. Dr. Marnie, in your opinion, is there a real danger that the Methodist Church will split? You know, I think there is a possibility. The question is, what does that mean? What, what splitting? It's hard to see how the church can split in two because I'm, I'm hearing more than two positions and things being discussed. And... Um, I confess I don't exactly know how to think about that. I mean, the Methodist Church, as it is, produced me. It, I've been the beneficiary of it. This is how I have met Jesus and served Jesus. Uh, so for me to hear that's going to be dissolved in certain ways sounds like bad news. On the other hand, if someone said to me, you have spent years criticizing the Methodist Church, and you've criticized the bishops, you've criticized the structure, uh, the bishops were so nice to receive me graciously because I had been quoted as saying the Council of Bishops was the bland leading the bland. Uh, and I said, I, I, I didn't mean that really, but, uh, but they, they overlooked that. Anyway, uh, but saying, you know, you, you said the church needs to change the way it operates and also maybe this is God. And yeah, I bet as you know from your own life, uh, you go into a situation that seems like a, a disaster and a very bad situation. But you, you, you go into every situation with God. And we have a God that loves to redeem disasters and loves to get into some of the worst times in our lives and be busy. So maybe God will find a way to get into our general conference. And even though if there is a split, there is dissolution, uh, God will uh, bring us out uh, as, as a more faithful church. And, and, but I don't know. Uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe we're being chastised by the Lord for our lack of faithfulness or our lack of uh, risk. So you don't know, and I, and I don't know. So, but, and I'm not that active in the deliberations, but, well, the thank, you, Bishop. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, we are ready to receive you at the reception through these doors or the Narthex doors into the gathering hall. Uh, Bishop Willman will be in momentarily to uh, sign the books that you pick up. So thank you and, and you're dismissed.